Tylea's Troubles, Part 83, The Battle of the Issean Hills, Late Autumn, 2403. Working with an almost frenzied vigour that few ordinary soldiers or labourers could ever match, the Disciplinati de Moore's dedicants had constructed substantial defences for their camp, despite the short time available before the Duchess's army marched out against them. Their brace of guns, which had once guarded Remus's southern gate, were placed in a bastion battery atop a steep slope, while the two large regiments of dedicants defended the almost complete stretch of barricades running out from the base of the hill. Maestro D'Aleone's engine of light had been hauled between the mass dedicants, while Captain Vogel and his disgraced professional soldiers of the old palace guard waited in the rear, Father Lorenzo amongst them, intending to move up to wherever they were needed. The two small companies of crossbowmen, one Riemann, one Urbeman, flanked the larger foot regiments, each having taken to raise ground to afford themselves a better view. Barone Pietro Chaibo, with his small company of light horse, waited out to the far left of the army, atop a little hill, having promised he would attempt to outflank the enemy. In truth, he had been entirely unwilling to dismount to help defend such walls of dirt. So it was pride that had sent him out so far from the rest. The vampire Duchess Maria, eager to destroy the foe quickly, amassed her army directly before the enemy's defences, intending to march right at them with no fancy manoeuvring. Her foot soldiers, being skeletons, crypt horrors and ghouls, formed the right of her army, arrayed before the defended stretch of barricades, while her knights, wraiths and wolves, herself and Bernhardt included, were on the left, hoping to overwhelm the defences at their extremity, burst through and thereafter ravage the camp's interior. As Maria intended her army to assault the foe as one, she restrained her rider's advance a little, so that when the army came close to the foe, they would do so cohesively. Her second, the vampire Bernhardt, rode with the smaller body of mounted soldiers, dropping back slightly to keep an eye on the enemy horse to the right. And, if that enemy proved too cowardly to commit, which he suspected might be the case, to espy an opportunity to support the rest of the army as required. The Morite dedicants watched the undead army's approach with a calm imbued by a resignation to their fate and the full belief that their god Moore favoured them above all others. He had tested them, without doubt, even allowing their worldly father to be cruelly taken from them, but they had proven themselves unshakable in their faith. Most now fervently believed Moore's love for them had only grown stronger. One regiment, fair bristled with the steel edges and barbed tips of a myriad varieties of vicious halberds, while the other regiment hefted flails, whips and clubs. Both chanted words of devotion, which filled them with an ever-growing lust for battle, a blind fury they were ready to release at any moment. From above, the Riemann gunners watched the enemy advance, judging the distances and adjusting the barrel's elevation accordingly. The undead foot, left a little behind by the mounted warrior's initial advance, having only Shank's nag to transport them, and being a little too far away from the Duchess to feel the full strength of her will, suddenly, but entirely, as she and her necromancer had planned, lurched forwards, powerfully invigorated by the winds of magic conjured to course through them. In this way, they realigned themselves with the horse soldiers. Maria's army was coming up fast indeed. Realising that to delay even a moment longer could mean he would fail even to distract the enemy as they advanced, never mind harm them, Barone Pietro led his horsemen down the slope to approach from the enemy's right flank. They were the only part of the living army that moved. The crew of the Luminarch, having worked upon their machine almost constantly since its shamefully negligible contribution to the assault on Viadaza, polishing the lenses almost hourly so that not one speck might ingrain itself upon the glass, now prayed fervently for Moore's blessing as they wound the wheel that would bring the foremost, smallest lens into alignment and so conjure and release a beam of scorching, etheric light. The whole engine bucked 
as a crackling condensation of energy broiled between the stepped lenses, then burst forwards to burn three of Maria's nightly companions to dust. The crew, however, failed even to notice the enemy riders' deaths, for once again, in exactly the same manner as had happened at Viadaza, the mizzen lens cracked, and, as well as momentarily sapping the breath from them, also sapped all hope that the engine would contribute any further harm to the foe. They had but one such lens left, the least perfect of the three they had begun the journey with, for its peripheries were not fully polished, and which would take many an hour to affix correctly and safely to the machine. Two of the crew shed tears at their failure, although within moments that disappointment had turned into fear, as they remembered just how close the terrible enemy was. Crossbow bolts brought down a few direwolves and skeletons, then the first round from the guns shattered the entire rear of Maria's knights, and the second broke the rest apart, even brushing Maria's arm as it passed. Maria was left alone, with only her ghostly wraiths close by. Twisting in her saddle, to see all about her, with a mere flick of her wrist, the Duchess Maria sent the direwolves charging into Baroni Pietro's company of light horse. One wolf was brought down by an arrow on the way, but the rest tore into the enemy with tooth and claw. In the first moments of the immediately ensuing fight, four riders and five wolves were slain. Another tiny gesture sent Maria's mounted wraiths hurtling into the fanatical dedicants nearest to them. Four Morites were hewn in two by the partly ethereal scythes, while the living warriors could do nothing at all to harm such a ghostly foe. Maria herself joined Captain Bernhardt and his little company of knights, but the magics both they and her necromancer Saphiro conjured had no effect. The enemy's prayers were not so weak, however, injuring one of the crypt horrors and summoning a holy protective blessing upon Captain Vogel's Riemann guard. The Abeman crossbowmen brought down one of Bernhardt's knights, and suddenly both vampires felt potentially vulnerable. Then, just when they might have fatally wounded the exposed vampires, not one, but both cannons misfired. Perhaps the crewmen's haste had caused their fumbling failure. Perhaps they had lost Moore's blessing, as the god's attention was elsewhere in the world. Or perhaps the powder was just a little too damp. The Baroni and his riders cut the last of the wolves down, then watched in horror as the blue-tinged wraiths continued their apparently unstoppable slaughter of the mass dedicants defending the wall. Maria sensed an opportunity. She saw the dedicants' blades sweeping by the dozen ineffectually through the hex rays, then noticed the gunners' frantic activity, desperately attempting to put their eerily quiet guns in working order. She knew this moment could be her best chance and so she ordered Bernhardt to leave her and charge the crossbowmen on the enemy camp's extreme left, and her crypt horrors and ghouls to charge into the unengaged regiment of dedicants. The latter failed to reach the enemy, so the brutes were left, for now, to fight alone. The crossbowmen failed to harm their attackers with their hurriedly launched bolts, then the vampire captain and his companions inflicted a brutal slaughter upon them. The last few fled, and the undead rider's mounts clattered over the bastion to penetrate the defences. Maria cast a deadly curse upon the dedicants fighting her wraiths, killing no less than eight of them. Then the hex rays killed two more, again just enough to ensure that the necromantic magic animating them stayed strong. The crypt horrors found themselves facing a great mass of dedicants, ensconced behind a sturdy earth and timber wall. They were to prove no match for the frenzied hacking of so many halberds, and all but one perished in the ensuing fight. Standing a little way behind, with the skeleton spear regiment, the necromancer Saphiro could see that it would take a lot more than a few horrors to defeat such a body. Maria was also cognizant of the situation, and took a moment to consider who to command to charge next. The hex rays had completely tied up the other body of dedicants, but she wanted both regiments utterly destroyed. This was the army who had killed her pet, Adolfo, and she intended that they would pay dearly for that deed. She felt a pleasing sense of reassurance that she was in a position to make such choices. 
Rather than being forced to respond to the enemy's manoeuvres, she had wrested the initiative for herself. Her victory, she believed, was now surely inevitable. Many of her soldiers would die to achieve it, but they'd all died before, and yet still they served her. She was so delighted with how things stood that she entirely failed to notice Baroni Pietro and his surviving riders approaching trepidatiously from her right. They were very aware of her, however. The Baroni himself was even considering the notion that perhaps he could take her on. Slowly, they closed upon her, the riders to loose their arrows, the Baroni to fire his pistols. Yet when they did, it was to no effect at all. Almost idly, Maria turned to look upon them, an evil euphoria coursing through her. They seemed to her to be nothing more than a minor itch. She smiled as she pondered if they themselves knew how little they concerned her. While she so leered, her hex rays continued their bloody work, slaying another half a dozen dedicants whilst the last of the brute horrors was cut down. Forgetting the riders, as soon as she looked away, she made up her mind. The ghouls would charge next. The great mob of flesh-eaters, who now equalled the enemy's regiment in numbers, thanks to the brute horrors' attacks and the cultists' own murderous flagellations to maintain their state of crazed frenzy, charged headlong into the defences. Maria cantered, with no real haste, to the hex-ray's flank, and watched as Captain Bernhardt and his knights turned to threaten the Riemann soldiery within the camp. Whilst the winds of magic proved little more than a gentle breeze, so that not one spell could be successfully conjured, the fight between the ghouls and the dedicants proved very bloody indeed. Seventeen dedicants died in the initial assault, and eighteen ghouls. Two more ghouls collapsed from the weakening of the magics that kept them whole. Captain Vogel knew he had to act decisively before the enemy riders could launch themselves at him and his men. But when he ordered a charge, his so-called professionals proved wanting, and their resultant, over-hesitant lurch meant that any initiative was lost. The vampire Bernhardt and his knights were already spurring their fleshless horses into action. Standing with the Riemanns, Father Lorenzo knew that the day was not going at all well, yet gave voice to prayers to gift Moore's holy protection on the men with him. He sensed its power as it enfolded both he and them. Upon the bastion battery to the disciplinati's right, the cannoneers had shoved packets of great shot down their pieces' muzzles, and now both guns blasted at the skeletons below them, shattering seven. Bony warriors, barely noticed, having long since been bereft of such concerns. The broken machine trundled about, behind the defences, its crew's shame exacerbated by the knowledge that they were very unlikely ever to get a chance to prove themselves or their engine in future battles. The Morite dedicants fighting the ghouls, however, were so gripped with bloodlust that no such defeatist thoughts impinged upon their minds. They slaughtered the last of the ghouls before them, to the loss of only one of their own to the foe's vicious claws, but at a cost of two of their own to flagellation. The hex rays to the left, however, had cut down another four dedicants amongst their brother regiment, who despite their manic efforts could cause absolutely no harm in return. Meanwhile, Maria sat delicately side-saddled beside them, as if nothing of consequence was occurring. Maria was smiling, but there was not a soul alive who could see. She blew a kiss to the vampire Bernhardt as he glanced at her upon the threshold of his charge, and then she joined the captain in hurtling headlong into Vogel's hesitant remans. The necromancer Safiro had watched the slaughter of both the brute horrors and the ghouls with interest, and was now satisfied to see that only a few dedicants remained upon the defences. My turn, he thought to himself, then raised his hands to command his skeletons to charge. In they went, scrabbling over the piles of corpses strewn before the barricades without a care in the world to stab a veritable forest of spears at the few poor, tired souls remaining at the wall. Before long, there was but one cultist remaining. He stumbled back, his pointed hood so obscuring his sight that he had no idea he was the last. Whatever idea he did have, however, was his last. While the hex rays scythes continued their bounteous harvesting of souls, Maria fatally cursed four of the Remans, then momentarily lost control of her magic while resurrecting the missing knight. 
She was only saved from injury by her magical wards. Several more Remans died to the vampires and knights' blades, and two of the knights were cut down in return. Somehow, the Remans had survived the initial impact, but their situation did not look good. As Maria's fight continued, cannonballs were fired to little effect, more dedicants were hewn by the wraiths, and crossbow bolts clattered ineffectually against the corpse cart. Baroni Pietro and his company rode to the rear of the undead and watched, aghast, as the slaughter went on. The riders dreaded the thought of charging in. Thankfully, for them, the Baroni gave no such command. Maria now allowed a fury to course through her, and she personally cut down six Remans. This, as well as the bloody work done by Bernhardt and the knights, was too much for the Remans, and they turned to flee. Father Lorenzo was the first to be cut down in the flight, and moments later Captain Vogel's head was deftly removed by Bernhardt's blade. The rest of the soldiers joined them in death very soon after. As the crossbowmen on the hill wished they had run away when they had had the chance, and the gunners abandoned their pieces to tumble pell-mell down the far slope, Baroni Pietro stared at the mass of skeleton warriors and the hideous corpse chariot before them. It suddenly dawned on the Baroni that he and his men might be the only ones to escape the slaughter. If, that is, they fled right now, which is what they did. <laughs>